This next session deals with the imperatives of the gospel with relationship to the culture. And it is our privilege to have the principal of Toronto Baptist Seminary and also professor of systematic theology and pastoral theology to address us, our brother Kirk Wellam. Well, thank you very much. In our first uh, session here today, uh, Steve's done a great job, I think, at uh, setting us up for where, where I want to go uh, in this next session. We had talked about this, so there was a little bit of uh, planning involved in terms of uh, how do you uh, distinguish uh, the theological uh, imperatives from gospel imperatives, how do you move from uh, theology proper to application when it comes to the church. And as we uh, discussed how to do that so we weren't overlapping too much, uh, we eventually started talking about the letters that we have in the uh, opening chapters of the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, uh, the letters to the uh, seven churches. And uh, we felt that this would uh, be a profitable uh, exercise to look at these uh, seven churches. Obviously, we've got to do it uh, kind of quickly. And the danger in what I am going to do uh, this morning is the problem of reductionism, where I just reduce things down until they become uh, too simple, and in that sense, distort uh, the riches of the material. Uh, but at the risk of that, uh, we're going to look at these uh, seven churches as uh, kind of case studies uh, that uh, enable us to, uh, to get a glimpse of the task that is before us as Christians and also some of the obstacles that we will encounter as uh, we uh, fulfill the responsibilities given to us uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ. And uh, just uh, uh, adding on, tying on to what Stephen has already said, it is because the church is a new covenant community, uh, because uh, it is uh, distinct from Israel in this sense. It flows out of Israel, it's pattern in Israel, as he said, there's a typological relationship. But because it is the new covenant community, uh, these letters were written uh, to these churches. Uh, in these letters, we have the Lord Jesus Christ, the head of the church, uh, the one who has brought the uh, enormous changes that uh, were surveyed for us uh, in our first lecture. Uh, it is the Lord Jesus Christ who addresses the churches and, uh, and uh, challenges them to be all that they should be uh, based on the fact that the new creation has begun, the kingdom has been inaugurated uh, and that, uh, that changes, uh, changes everything. Now, uh, just to give us a little bit of uh, background, the seven churches addressed by Jesus in Revelation 2 and 3 are representative of churches uh, in the gospel age. And I think we uh, see that in, in a number of ways. Just one way that I will point out is at the end of each of the letters, at the end of each of the seven letters, uh, we have... Uh, these words uh, that the person who has ears, whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the, not just the church, but to the churches. And this is repeated over and over again, seven times, uh, which indicates that there is a message being delivered to the specific church addressed, but there is more than that. The Spirit of God uh, is speaking to to all the churches, and I don't think uh, we should restrict that to the churches that existed uh, in the first century in a specific geographical location, uh, but to the churches that will exist as, as was mentioned in the inter-advental period, in the period of time between the first and second comings of Christ. Now, the churches that are addressed, the seven churches, can be divided into uh, three groups. We have churches in danger of extinction. The first and the last church fall into that category, Ephesus and Laodicea. 
We have churches that are faithful under fire, uh, particularly uh, Smyrna and Philadelphia. And then we have a group of churches uh, in the middle, a, a kind of uh, mixture of things that are good and things that are not good. And this would be uh, the church in Pergamum, in Thyatira, and in Sardis. I'll be making further distinctions as I go, but just as a general uh, a kind of guide as we, as we approach these seven churches, I think it's very helpful to, uh, to divide them up in this way and to start to analyze what's taking place. Uh, there is also, it's been pointed out uh, by uh, scholars and commentators, there's a, also a kind of chiastic structure so an A, B, C, 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 B, A structure, so that uh, churches one in seven uh, have something in common, namely extinction. Churches two and six, faithful under fire. And then in this middle group, three, four, and five, uh, the mixed bag, uh, uh, so to speak. Now, proper interpretation of these letters will involve an understanding of the historical situation and that's where I'm going to really have to skimp uh, this morning because we, we can't go into a lot of historical detail. But uh, it's easy for you to uh, research this on your own if you'd like more information. Uh, a good Bible commentary, study Bibles have lots of very, very helpful information on the historical situation. But we need to be aware of that. Uh, then we need to appreciate how much of the uh, book of Revelation as a whole and and how uh, much these seven letters draw upon imagery that comes from the Old Testament. It, it is amazing. You really can't make sense of the book of Revelation if you don't know your Old Testament, and for that matter, if you don't know the rest of the New Testament that precedes uh, this uh, final book of the biblical uh, canon. Uh, so we uh, pay attention to the historical situation, uh, we're aware of uh, Old Testament uh, scripture, and then we want to reflect, of course, on the present age, the time in which we're living. Here we are in Canada, celebrating you know, 150 years, as has been mentioned. And uh, we're in the city of Toronto, uh, in Canada. And, and, and how do these letters speak to issues uh, here at this time and in this place? Now the reader, the careful reader, also needs to be aware of the uh, location of the letters and the influence of the letters on the rest of the book. And this is the last thing I'll mention by uh, way of introduction. These letters, you say oh, this is really obvious stuff, chapters two and three, they come after chapter one. Well, yeah, but sometimes it's those obvious things that are, are significant. That's the case here. Because in chapter one, we have uh, not only introductory words that are important, but we have a remarkable vision of the Son of Man. Uh, again, rich with an Old Testament background, but this vision of the Son of Man casts a shadow, as it were, over the rest of the book, and it casts a shadow over these seven letters because each of the letters will draw upon the vision in one way or another as the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Son of Man, introduces himself uh, to uh, the churches. And then taken together, chapters 1, 2, and 3, the vision of the Son of Man and the letters to the seven churches, taken together, they really set the stage for what follows in the rest of the book. So if you're going to understand chapters 4 to 22, you really need to understand chapters 1, 2, and 3. And the more I study the book of Revelation, the more I'm convinced of that. 4 to 22 people like getting it. It's got all the visions and the beasts and the dragons and, and uh, so forth and so on. Uh, but that's really an elaboration on the truths that are laid down in chapters 1, 2, and 3. Now, the letters will all proceed in the same way. Uh, Jesus will uh, present himself to each church. He will review the churches positively and negatively. He will give counsel. We can say it's kingly counsel. You know, one thing that's often overlooked is that uh, uh, the exposition of Christ as king 
requires that we care, uh, carefully consider the book of Revelation because he comes uh, to the church as the great King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and he speaks to uh, his people. There is a call to respond, and then there is a promise of uh, eternal life. But we've chosen these churches because uh, they illustrate what we are up against until Christ comes again, what we're up against in Canada, in the United States, in Europe, uh, in Asia, wherever we are in the world. This, uh, th these are the kinds of issues that we're going to have to contend with uh, as Christians. So at the risk of reductionism, we will seek to capture the essence of each ecclesial situation uh, to learn how we should parse our present predicament and understand where we go from here. Now note, only two of the seven churches are faithful. Only two. And the chiastic structure highlights this sad reality. It begins with a church in danger of extinction, and it ends with the same thing. And in the middle, you know, where, our, where the focus is, the three churches that are found there, well, they got some good, but they've also got some serious problems that need to be addressed. Well, you know, in some ways that should be an encouragement to us, because we know if we've been around churches any length of time, that there's a lot of work to do. And this basically reinforces that that will be the case until Jesus comes again. Right? So if you have any illusions of creating the perfect ecclesiastical situation, give them up. <laughs> it's going to be in struggle until our Lord returns. Notice as well that there's no one-size-fits-all uh, solution. Always be wary of people who come peddling the answer. Uh, there is no the answer unless you're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ himself and then the application, the varied application of his work uh, to various situations. Uh, each congregation receives particular attention. And uh, there is a fascinating connection between the churches and the cities in which they're located. I'll only be able to touch on that. Okay, let's uh, look at these, uh, at these seven churches. It'll be a, a quick look. Uh, but what I'm going to try to do, and, and what I guess I'd like you to take away is when you, when you, from this point on, when you think about the church in Ephesus or Smyrna or Pergamum or Thyatira or so forth, uh, you think about, okay, this, this church is an example of uh, this particular problem. And, and we need to be aware of it. Because the other thing we can say is it's not as if you know, one church is uh, you know, perfectly represented by any of the seven. You can have combinations of the seven or you can have, you can have in the life of a church uh, a kind of Ephesian period or a, 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 a Smyrnarian period or whatever word you would use. You, you, you can see these things can be uh, mixed and mingled in a variety of ways. So uh, the church in Ephesus. Now just because of the quantity of scripture, I'm not going to read the letter. I'll refer to key uh, points of these letters as I go. But I'll leave it up to you to actually uh, read the text. I wish I, I could, but uh, uh, we don't have the time. Uh, but the letter to the church in Ephesus. Uh, this I, I want us to consider as a church that is orthodox, but is uh, loveless. Or to put it another way, it is a church that is orthodox, that's very concerned about uh, proper theology and right thinking and so forth, but is failing when it comes to the strategic task of witness and evangelism in our world. And as we, as we heard in the first, sen uh, first session, this, this is an important part of what it means to be the church. We are called to be a faithful witness to the world. So here's a church that has a good grasp of the truth, but for one reason or another, has, has uh, pulled back within itself and uh, therefore is very strongly challenged uh, by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Ephesus uh, was the fourth largest city in the Roman Empire 
It was important politically, commercially, and uh, geographically. As with almost all of these cities, uh, there uh, was uh, uh, an element of pagan uh, religious worship that was taking place, uh, as well as emperor worship, the mm -hmm. wor worship of the Roman emperor, and Ephesus was no, no exception. Uh, there was a massive temple to Artemis. Uh, in Acts 19, you have that fascinating account uh, of Paul getting into trouble because as a result of preaching the gospel, uh, Demetrius and the, and the uh, silversmiths were, were losing business because they made you know, little trinkets that, that uh, supported and celebrated false religion. And so they're upset with Paul. And uh, we're also told in Acts 19 about a big bonfire that was held and people were converted. They brought all their occult objects and scrolls and so forth and burned them as, a, as an act of, of uh, repentance. Uh, so it, it, it's a, a city that, that is, uh, got some great things about it. Uh, it it's important, but uh, there are some real challenges when we think about uh, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a city in which Paul ministered in the lecture hall of Tyrannus for two years, uh, and also uh, Timothy ministered there, uh, as did the apostle John. Jesus writes to them, and he writes to them, he speaks to them as the one who holds the seven stars or angels in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. Uh, this, I think, is a way of, of, of saying that he comes to them with all of the authority of, of Yahweh. Uh, he comes to them with all the authority of God because, of course, we know that uh, he is God. And he comes as one who knows about their particular situation. He knows them through and through. He says he knows their deeds. He knows their hard work. He knows their perseverance. He knows their, their hardships. He knows that they haven't grown weary. They didn't wilt under pressure. There was a resiliency to them that, uh, that is to be commended. He knows furthermore that they were passionate for the truth, that they were intolerant of wicked men, and they had tested those who claimed to be apostles, but were not. And they also were opposed to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. They will uh, reoccur uh, in these letters, uh, teaching that uh, our Lord is opposed to that he hates as well. Well, when you think about the different people who ministered in Ephesus, you think about the Apostle Paul, you think about Timothy and the instructions that he received, uh, as uh, we have them recorded in First and Second Timothy. Uh, you, you, you think about uh, John, uh, who uh, was there later on. Uh, it is no wonder that you've got a church uh, that is orthodox in terms of its understanding of the gospel. It's no wonder that you've got a group of people who are zealous for truth. They have learned these things from uh, their mentors, from those uh, who have gone before. But, our Lord says, I've got uh, a problem with you. I've got something against you. And what is that? Well, he says, you've forsaken your first love. Now, this is debated among the commentators. What, what does it mean? Uh, you know, most obvious suggestion, of course, would it, uh, is that it would mean love for God. Somehow, in all of their activity and all of their, uh, their theologizing and so forth, their hearts had grown cold with regard to the Lord. And note that there's an element of truth there. But I think more could be said. I'm going to say more. <laughs> uh, others would say, well, maybe they were failing in their, in their brotherly uh, love, and the love that ought to exist between brothers and sisters in the Church of Jesus Christ. And note that there's an element of truth there. Uh, others have said, well, maybe it's their love for the world. Now I think we're getting a little closer to what, what is going on. Uh, we, we ought to have a love for the world, not the love of, of sympathetic engagement, but a, a love that, that drives witness, right? A love that uh, impels us to go and to, and to uh, share the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with them. Uh, Gregory Beale and his uh, you know, great massive commentary on the book of Revelation argues uh, along these lines, argues that, that it's not just love for God in general or love for the you know, Christian brothers and sisters uh, in general, but, but it, it, it is a deficiency of love that manifested itself in a failure to witness 
uh, to the world around. There, there was an evangelistic failure uh, early on in the early days of the church. They had, they had been engaged in this kind of thing. But as time had gone on, perhaps they uh, faced persecution or trouble of various sorts. We don't know exactly all the reasons, but for some reason they had pulled back within their shell. And although they were very orthodox and although they were concerned to maintain internal purity, they were in danger of becoming like old Israel. And as we saw in the first session, this must not be. Because this new covenant community, and this is uh, also, you know, support for this idea can be, can be drawn from the whole lampstand imagery and so forth and so on. These people are to be a light to the world, right? They're not to be like old Israel. Israel was to be a light to the world, but it failed in its task. And this new Israel, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, must not fail. It must proclaim God's truth. And this is such a serious matter that our, our Lord says to the uh, folks in Ephesus that if you, if you don't consider how far you have fallen, if you don't repent, if you don't do the things you did at first, that he will come and he will, and I think this is significant too, remove the lampstand. You're not going to shine as a light. I'll take the light away. <coughs> The church will no longer exist. The church of Jesus Christ will always exist. But this local manifestation of the church will no longer exist. So critical is witness to our task. This is a message that we, we need to hear, we need to remember. Right? Especially if we're uh, concerned about theology and orthodoxy, which I think we are. We need to remember that God has not given us these things and trusted us with these things just for our own enjoyment so that we might you know, debate various facets of truth with one another. Our end game, our ultimate goal is to find a way to communicate it to the lost and dying people of this world who need this message of salvation, which only we can declare. See, going back to you know, church and state and so forth, uh, while it's a good thing to feed the hungry and, and provide clean water and teach people how to plant crops and so forth, and, and Christians should be involved in that if God has given them expertise in those areas. Uh, and I, I say this very carefully. There is a sense, though, in which any sinner can do that who has expertise in those areas. But the task that is given to us that only we can do as Christians is to proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And our Lord comes to these folks in Ephesus and says, if you don't repent, if you don't, if you don't remember uh, what you were doing, and what it was like in those early days, if you don't renew that love for me and love for one another and love for the world that makes you open your mouth, then I'm going to shut the place down. Church in Smyrna, I want us to think of this church as an afflicted, poor, slandered, congregation, but faithful. This is, uh, this is one of the two churches along with Philadelphia that receives no rebuke from the Lord. But this is, you know, not necessarily the kind of church you might flock to if you knew something about uh, the trouble that it had seen, and not only that it had seen, but it was going to see in the future. Now, Smyrna is... Uh, modern Izmir, 56 kilometers north of Ephesus. Apparently it was a beautiful city, had paved streets, at least the main streets, had a library, had a gym. <laughs> I mean, we think gyms are, I don't know if they CrossFit and stuff like that back then, but, uh, but they had a gym. Uh, it was, uh, had a shrine to Homer, and that's not Homer Simpson, this is the other Homer. <laughs> uh, it had a shrine to, to Homer. Uh, it, it was a, not a notable center for emperor worship, and it had a temple to the goddess Roma. Also had a significant Jewish uh, population, and that's going to be significant in this case. Uh, Christians in Smyrna were persecuted. Probably the persecution was tied to the fact that as time went on, uh, Christianity, which initially enjoyed the umbrella protection of Judaism, uh, as time went on, that, that protection dissipated. So the Jews received 
kind of special uh, uh, exemptions in, in first century Roman culture when it came to uh, emperor worship and so forth uh, as a way of respecting their sensibilities and their uh, you know, theological uh, uh, commitments. And, uh, and, when, and when Christianity came on the scene, it was viewed, uh, especially by the Romans, as just an, another Jewish sect, a division of Judaism. And so there was, uh, they, they benefited, the church benefited from, you know, from the same kind of exemptions that Judaism as a whole enjoyed. But as time went on, the Jewish leaders made it very, very clear that this is not a sect of Judaism. This is a heretical group of people. And, and they were, uh, you know, distance was put between you know, the synagogue and the Christian communities. And as that happened, uh, then they became more liable to, to persecution. Now, in the first century, um, access to public monies was tied to Roman cult and emperor worship. You always got to be aware of public money. <laughs> we know that, right? And the government comes handing out money. There's always strings attached. Right? And uh, this was true way back then. So if you wanted to get access to public money, you had to kind of you know, pay obeisance at some level to, uh, to the, you know, the people that were running things. And non-participation was seen as unpatriotic and disloyal, which would then make persecution of this unpatriotic, disloyal group of people justifiable, right? So, uh, Jesus comes to them, and, and again, notice how his introduction of himself is so beautifully suited to the situation. Jesus uh, comes to them, and he speaks to them as the first and the last, as the one who died and who came to life again. What is he emphasizing? Well, he's emphasizing his eternal nature. He's emphasizing his sovereignty over history. He's emphasizing, I think, in a particular way that he is the resurrected one and he has triumphed. If you want background for this introduction, then read Paul's words in Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 to 11. Or read uh, his words to the Colossians, Colossians 1, verses 15 uh, to 20. Uh, as the one who died, and we, we could say suffered and died, and came to life again. He knows all about their afflictions. He knows all about their poverty. But he says, you are rich. You see, there are riches and there are riches. And when the Lord Jesus Christ says you're rich, you're rich. And if he says you're poor, you're poor, no matter how rich you think you might be. He says of these poor folk, you're rich. He says, I know the slander of those who say they are Jews, but are not. And then he says something we've got to handle very carefully. He says, they're a synagogue of Satan. There's a lot of theology embedded in that little phrase. But again, I think a lot of it was unpacked in what we heard in the first session. The people of God have been redefined in light of, of what? In light of who? Well, in light of the coming of the true Israel, the true firstborn son, he has come. And how do we know that he's the true Israel and the true firstborn son? Well, if we listen to what the gospel writers say about his baptism, we get some insight. If we, if we see him being thrust by the spirit out into the wilderness to suffer the assault of Satan for 40 days and 40 nights, we get some understanding. We listen to his words when he says, I am the true vine. We get some insight into his understanding. But, but it's when we come to that open grave on what we know is Easter Sunday morning, oh, then it starts to make sense, doesn't it? Yes, he, he, is, the, he is the, what, the first and the last. Uh, he is the one who died, and he is the one who has come to life again. And he says to these people who are suffering, he says to them, I know, 
I know about your suffering. I know about your poverty. I know about the slander. But he says, it's only temporary. It's only temporary. It's, in fact, typical of this gospel age. It's, in fact, to be expected by those who follow in the footsteps of such a master. Their Lord has suffered, and he calls them to suffer. Talks about prison, but in those days they didn't put people in prison just to teach them a lesson for a while. You were put in prison because you were usually awaiting a death sentence. You're going to go to prison. Uh, you're going to suffer 10 days. I don't have time to unpack that. I think that is, goes back to the book of Daniel and Daniel chapter 1 and all kinds of imagery there that would explain that for us. Uh, but he's basically saying, it's all right. In the end, it will be okay. And, and if we can bring in a, a wider theological picture, we could, we could put it like this. In the end, it will be okay because... You see, when I rose from the dead, I rose the firstborn from the dead. My resurrection guarantees the harvest. So you hang in there. If you're called upon to suffer, you suffer because it's not the final word, you see. You need to be resilient. You need to be calm. You need to be determined. You need to press on. <laughs> of course, he has every right to say that. <clears throat> what about the church in Pergamum? Well, here's a church that I, I'm presenting to you as a, a church that was externally vigilant, but had been internally compromised. Externally vigilant, but internally compromised. Uh, Pergamum was a city of about 100,000 people when this letter was written to them. Uh, it was uh, 113 kilometers north of Smyrna. It was an inland city, 27 kilometers inland. It was really an amazing place. It had a huge library, 200,000 volume library. It was also a religious center. It had a 40 foot high statue of Zeus, who was considered the king of the gods. Also had a shrine to the god of healing, uh, to uh, Athena, Demeter, and Dionysius. It was the center of, of, uh, of Roman government and of emperor you know, cult worship. It, had a, it was the warden of Caesar's temple. And it was the first city to build a temple to a Roman ruler, and that ruler was Augustus. But it, interestingly enough, it is called by our Lord as the place where Satan lives. When secular government, false religion come together, and when they set up their main offices in one city, from the Lord's perspective, that's the place where Satan lives. And we see that here. And our Lord comes to them with a sharp, double-edged sword. In other words, he comes to them as, as we, we, we could say, the royal judge. Uh, again, he knows. You see, over and over again, <laughs> this, this thing here, he knows, I know. All the omniscience of the Lord is a wonderful truth, but it cuts both ways, right? He knows the good, he knows the struggles, he knows the reality. Uh, but he also knows, and on the basis of that knowledge, he's able to render perfect judgment. He says, I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet, he says, you have remained true to my, na uh, my name, faithful, uh, e even in the days of Antipas, uh, who I guess was a, uh, a witness, a faithful witness, someone who was martyred. Uh, where Satan lives, he has emphasized a couple of times. It's a particular manifestation of, 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 of satanic, of evil influence in the city of Pergamum. He says, although you have resisted you know, things externally, you've been, ex you've been vigilant uh, externally, he says, I've got a problem, and my problem is this. 
summed up in two words, Balaam and the Nicolaitans. <coughs> Apparently the word Nicolaitans can be kind of translated, interpreted as victory people. It doesn't necessarily tell us exactly what they believe, but they're connected uh, in, in these letters with, with false teaching and false practice. But the idea of victory, people, may, may indicate that they pres kind of presented this as a, a kind of triumphalism. Like, this is the way to go. We'll show you how to have victory. How you, can, how you can survive. How you can thrive. How you can get ahead, even in the place where Satan lives. You know, we'll show you how a little pragmatism goes a long way. A little common sense. You have to know how to, you know, have to know how to play, you know, both sides. You have to know how to, you know, give the, the Romans, the emperor, what he wants and how to, you know, negotiate all the intricacies of false worship. What I'm suggesting here may be borne out. We have more information, of course, about Balaam, a mercenary, a, a prophet who was a mercenary. It's always a terrible thing prophet who God used in spite of himself, but a prophet who is notorious in the scriptures, not just for the linkage of, of covetousness with his prophetic ministry, but he's infamous in the scriptures because he, he eventually gave to the enemies of the people of God this bit of advice. You know, I, I can't curse them. God won't let me. But Send your women in among them. Send your people in among them. Intermarry. And in this way, dilute the worship of the true and living God. In this way, lead the people of God astray. And the Lord says to this church in Pergamum, you've got, you've got a strain of this Balaam virus within the body. You've, you've got these Nicolaitans, these victory people. And you must repent, or I will come, says the Lord, and I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And that's also really fascinating, because if you know about Balaam, you know he was, and I guess it's appropriate given what I've said about him already, he was rebuked by a donkey. He was rebuked by his donkey because the donkey had more sense than Balaam had. Because when the angel of the Lord stood in the path with its sword drawn, and the donkey saw the angel, the donkey, donkey deviated from the path. God bail him all upset. But the donkey really saved his life, even though Balaam beat his donkey. It wasn't until the Lord opened his eyes that Balaam understood what the donkey understood. Which again, I think, you know, it's just, it just tells us a lot about you get, you get you're a mercenary. You're a mercenary Preacher of the gospel, why a donkey's got more sense than you do, <laughs> really. Really, because you're taking the most precious thing in all the world and you're trying to pass it off for a few pesos. Very, very, very foolish. Well, the Lord says, repent. Uh, well, come and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. You see, he's, he's zealous for the purity of his people. And we must be too. It's not enough just to, you know, to resist, you know, externally. We must also be concerned that while we're, uh, while we're resisting external pressure, that internally we're not allowing uh, a, a kind of pragmatism to, to take root that will eventually be destructive uh, of the body as a whole. And, and, and this is, is, is a very real thing in, in, in our day as well. You know, you can, churches can stand and stand and stand and, 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 and then there's this, there's this kind of virus that's in there. And the Lord says it must be dealt with. I, I am, I'm looking for purity all the way through. I have died to secure a bride who is free from every uh, blemish and spot and wrinkle. And this, therefore, must be dealt with. What about Thyatira? i got to hurry on here. Well, here's a church. I'd like us to think of it in terms of, of a church that uh, is, is loving, faithful. Uh, 
hardworking, persevering, but like Pergamum, and this of course is going to be my challenge here, and I don't, and I don't want to just see things where they don't exist, but, but like Pergamum, there's an internal problem, and here I'm, I'm going to describe it as an entrenched, devilish kind of error. And, and if you were to ask me, okay, what's the difference between the internal problem in Pergamum and the one in Thyatira? Well, what I'm going to suggest to, to you is that I think maybe the one in Thyatira is, is a little more sophisticated. Uh, Pergamum, more pragmatic. You know what pragmatism is. You know, if, if it works, it's good, right? But, but here in, in Thyatira, I think there are a number of indicators that hint at something a little more subtle going on. Well, let's see, how do I get to that? Well, uh, Pergamum, uh, 64 kilometers, uh, or the Thyatira located 64 kilometers southeast of Pergamum. Again, many trade guilds, each with its own deity. So you had these trade guilds, you know, like old unions or something like this, and they all had their own patron deity. It was the home of Lydia. It was the least important of the seven churches, but it receives the longest message, interestingly enough. And our Lord introduces himself as the Son of God whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. And again, that, that goes back to the vision in the first chapter, except in the first chapter we'd have no reference to the Son of God. We have, though, the word Son of Man. But the simplest way to explain this is that this is a divinely inspired exposition of the meaning of the phrase Son of Man. Right? He is the Son of Man, yes, but when you really understand all that that means, He is at one and the same time the Son of God. And the imagery of a fla uh, blazing fire and, and, uh, and a feet like burnished bronze, I think, goes back to Daniel chapter 3. And, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace and also picks up son of God. You know, who, who is that in there? Who's that fourth man in there? Well, that's one like a son of God. So you see there's a rich uh, interplay uh, in, in this passage. But he comes to them and he says, I know your deeds. I know your love, your faith, your perseverance. And, and, and I know that you're, you're doing more now than you did at the beginning. That's, yeah, that's really good. That wasn't true of Ephesus. You, you guys are... You know, you're, you're, you're doing well, and as time goes on, you're doing even better. But there's a problem. What's the problem? Well, it's not Balaam and the Nicolaitans. It's Jezebel and her children. And, of course, again, we're thrown back into the Old Testament. But Jezebel and her children, I think, is, is being used as a, a reference to the fact that there's false teaching, there's false uh, prophecy. And in the book of Revelation, false teaching and false prophecy is beastly. It is beastly. This is being tolerated within the body. And this corrosive teaching is leading people astray into immorality and into idolatry. It, it may be actually physical immorality, uh, but it, it is certainly uh, spiritual immorality. You're leading the church astray. You're corrupting the people of God. Now, here's where I get the idea that it's a little more sophisticated. Uh, our Lord talks here about a kind of insider revelation into Satan's so-called deep secrets. So if Pergamum was wrestling with a, a pragmatic error, then perhaps we can say of Thyatira, uh, this is uh, you know, more of a, of a sophisticated uh, kind of prophetic error in which what is being taught is being passed off as some kind of deep, deep, profound secret. Satan loves to do that. I mean, how many times is error passed off as deep, Thought. And is the truth minimized as being elementary, fundamentalistic, you know, so basic, so naive, so old fashioned? And we heard all that stuff? Sure, we have. What's the matter with you? I, I thought you were an intelligent person. You mean you believe all that old stuff? 
Oh, now come. There are, there are, there are depths of wisdom and understanding that, that, that you need to grapple with. Come out to our studies. Come sit in our classes. Come read our books and our blogs. Come learn the deep things, the mysteries. Our Lord says, this is what you need to do. You need to deal with this falsehood and you need to hold on to what you have until I come. No innovation. That's not what we're called to do. We're not called to innovate the truth. We are called to proclaim the truth. I know the truth must be applied afresh in our day and age, but the body of truth that has been entrusted to us is wonderfully fixed. And my task, our task as Christians, is not to improvise. It's not to say, well, the culture is saying this, the world's saying that, and uh, we're just not going to get anywhere. No one's going to pay any attention to us if we kind of state things the way it's always been stated. We're going to have to find you know, new ways of, of trying to convince them that, yeah, we're really cool, and we're really with it, and we're on side with all that you're doing, while at the same time trying to hold on to some kind of orthodoxy. Forget it. It won't work. It won't work. You'll alienate yourself from those who know the truth, and the world will never accept you anyway. They won't. Well, they might quote you once in a while, say, well, even so-and-so agrees with us. But they'll never accept you. Forget it. You're tainted goods. Hold on, he says. Hold on to what you have till I come. I haven't had a chance in any of these letters you might have noticed to talk about the prize that is given, but I'll just say a quick word about that at the end. Uh, Church in Sardis, oh man, i got to go here. Church in Sardis, what, what about it? Well, I'll cut to the chase. The church in Sardis is a, a stunted church living on reputation, but out of touch with reality. Sardis was located 56 kilometers southeast of Thyatira. It was a large city, port and Jewish population. Sardis and Philadelphia suffered an earthquake in 17 AD, and they were rebuilt with Roman help. Again, theater, stadium, uh, the marble road, the center road in the place was made of marble. Pretty fancy, right? Temples. But it had an unfinished temple to Artemis. That was kind of interesting. It's a characteristic of the city. Started to build a temple to Artemis, but didn't finish it. And another thing you need to know is that twice, although Sardis was geographically located in, in what was a, a militarily strategic location, so it was located in a place that made it very difficult to attack. Although that was the case, twice in its history it had been breached because the watchmen had failed to keep watch. If they had done their job, they would have seen the enemy coming and they would have been able to repel them, but because the watchmen failed to do their job, the city was breached. Our Lord comes to them and he speaks to them as the one who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. He speaks to them, I think, as the head of the church who is full of the spirit. That's what he is, full of the spirit. Possesses the spirit without measure. He's the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 11 where we have a sevenfold description of the spirit. He possesses the spirit of God without measure. He comes to them in another um, kind of metaphor would be the, the captain of the heavenly host. That's who he is. In other words, he says, I can help. I can help. He says, I know your deeds, your reputation for being alive, but he says, you're dead. Imagine what it would have been like to have received that letter. You have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. In other words, you're living in the past. You're out of touch with reality. He says, it's time for you to wake up. You've got to strengthen what remains and is about to die. In other words, you, you people have got to finish. You know, just like that unfinished temple of Artemis. Not that they should finish that, but you people need to finish. You, need, you people need to rouse yourselves. You need to, people need to, 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 to face life as it is in the present situation and not, you know, be back in the good old days. Those good old days are gone and they're not coming back. The, the battle that's coming to you is coming to you presently. And again, he says, remember what you have received and hold it fast and repent. 
You know, walk in this truth today. Beautiful, isn't it? Okay, the church in Philadelphia. Here's a small but mighty church. Uh, 48 kilometers southeast of Sardis, important commercial city on the trade routes and everything else. Uh, temples to Zeus and the Roman Emperor, facing significant pressure from the pagan culture, but also again from a synagogue of Satan, from the Jewish population. And our Lord comes to this church. This, is, this uh, church is like Smyrna, doesn't receive a word of criticism. The Lord comes to this church and he says to them, he, come, well, he comes to them as the one who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he shuts, no one can open. Uh, or what he opens, no one can shut. What he shuts, no one can open. He, in other words, he's, he's coming to them as the, you know, the one who controls entrance to the kingdom, if you like. He fulfills the role of Eliakim, again going back into the Old Testament. Uh, he uh, is the one who has the ultimate power of salvation and judgment. And he says, I know your deeds. I have placed before you an open door, which I understand to be a door of opportunity. And, I, and personally, I think it's a door of opportunity for a ministerial evangelistic success within the Jewish community. A Jewish community that was opposed to them, was creating a lot of trouble for them. But I've opened the door for you. And, and I'm going to bring these Jewish people to see that Israel has been redefined. And that the love of God expressed for Israel has now and is now being manifested upon the true Israel, the true people of God that have emerged out of all of the Old Testament uh, works of God in redemptive history that has emerged now as a result of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his pouring out of the Spirit on the day of Pentecost. You're going to experience trouble. You don't do this kind of evangelistic work without difficulty. But listen, he says, you'll be kept safe. See, the Lord doesn't promise us exemption from trouble. But he does promise us safety uh, in the end. Laodicea, well, this is a rich, smug group of people whom the Lord finds thoroughly nauseating. What a shock that must have been. I mean, can't we imagine this powder puff crowd? <laughs> There they are. Parking lot full of fine chariots, <laughs> dressed in all the latest clothes. Uh, Laodicea, uh, prosperous financial, medical uh, center, uh, manufacturing center, especially in terms of textiles. Two theaters, a stadium. Uh, Zeus was worshipped there. Uh, the God of healing was worshipped there. Who He was the patron of the medical school. But you see, Laodicea had a water problem. For all their money, they had lousy water. Uh, the the, the Lycus River that was nearby, the water was horrible there. So they had to pipe water in through an aqueduct from the south. I think they piped it, what is it, about eight kilometers, something like that. And, and uh, they piped it from hot springs. Mm -hmm. So when the water arrived in Laodicea, what was it? Well, it was lukewarm. And not only was it lukewarm, but you know, the, the aqueduct wasn't all that great in those days. And so it would leach minerals. And so it not only was lukewarm, but it tasted horrible. Right? This, was, this was a well-known problem there in old Laodicea. And, and, and uh, the Lord comes to this group of people and he addresses them as the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation which is just another way of saying, I'm the yes of God. I'm the foundation and standard of all revelation. I'm the be ruler and, and, and really the beginning, I think, of God's new creation. That's what I am. And he says, I know your deeds. Uh, and there's no commendation for this church. They're unfaithful. They, they, they are thoroughly uh, compromised culturally. Or as he puts it, they're lukewarm. And, and, and basically says to them, I, I wish that you were either hot or cold, which doesn't mean I wish that you were all for me or all against me. A lot of people interpret it that way. That's wrong. 
Uh, it, what he's saying is, I wish that you were either hot, that is, you had some medicinal value to you, or I wish that you were cold, so that when uh, you know, I took a drink of you, you were refreshing, like a cold drink on a hot day. But you're not, you're lukewarm. Because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. But to this church, although there's not a word of commendation, there is such a loving entreaty. I think commentators are right who see the language drawn from the Song of Solomon of all places and also from other passages where Christ presents himself not only as a lover but as a master. And here he comes to this church and says, I'm knocking at the door. Open the door. I'll come in. I'll sup with you. I'll fellowship with you. Things will be restored. We'll get this thing back on track. Now, what I didn't have a chance to mention, I can do it really in a sentence or two, is at the end, there's a unique promise. We, we don't have time to go through them. But basically, the promises are, can be summed up in, in one thing, eternal life in the presence of God. That's what they're all about. And they come in different forms based on the individual city that's being addressed. But the promise for all these, if you overcome, if you are victorious, <laughs> I'll give you a new name. I'll feed you with new manna. You'll have a place in the new Jerusalem. You'll never be removed from the temple of God. I'll, I'll, I'll let you reign with me on my throne. I've been given authority to reign. And you will share in that reign. So to sum up, no perfect churches in this in inter-advental period. And you say, well, what about those churches that didn't receive criticism? Well, I mean perfect in the sense that, yeah, they didn't receive criticism, but they were called to suffer. So, you know, in one sense, if you were to look at a group of people and say, well, who does God, from a worldly perspective, who does God uh, approve of more? You'd say, well, surely it's the ones with all the blessings in Laodicea. Or surely it's this group or that group, you know, located in the, in the center of power there, Pergamum. No, no. No, they, actually the, the, the most faithful churches, the most blessed churches, were the ones that were suffering most intensely. So we have to be very careful. The Lord doesn't evaluate things the way we do. But uh, our task, regardless of our situation, is to bear witness. This will bring trouble. But our hope is in God. Whoever has ears, let them hear. Let us hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. Are you listening?